Alors, je vous le disais, hein, ce sont toute une série de séquences. On a encore cinq séquences ce matin. Je ne vous dis pas la densité de, de la matinée. On, on a vu évidemment des premiers projets. C'est important aussi de prendre du recul, d'avoir une vision un peu mondiale et, et stratégique du marché, on va dire à l'horizon 2030 et même au-delà. Et donc, pour en parler, j'invite et je vais la retrouver avec grand plaisir euh, sur scène, euh, Madame Tina Brou à revenir et Monsieur euh, Macha Hiro euh, Kouniya. Je vous en prie, venez avec moi. Hello, thank you very much. I'm very happy. Everything is uh, okay on the on synergy. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you have a lot of things to do on this, uh, this event. Thank you very much for uh, being uh, with me again. It's very nice. Uh, Tina Brou, um, Minister of uh, Petroleum and Energy of Norway. Donc, on va parler à nouveau de la Norvège et de ses enjeux en se tournant un peu plus vers euh, les enjeux euh, de l'éolien offshore flottant, puisque c'est notre sujet ce matin. On va faire aussi un tour d'horizon euh, de l'Asie, avec notamment euh, certains intervenants en visioconférence dans un instant. Thank you very much, uh, Mashairo uh, Kuniya, Director Representative Office in Europe of NEDO. You will... Uh, Uh, tell us a little bit more about the situation in, in Japan and the strategy for offshore wind in a few minutes. Uh, uh, and on va parler aussi des états unis On aura une vidéo aussi pour témoigner. Vous voyez, on va faire un grand tour d'horizon. Uh, I start with you, Tina. <laughs> Can I, uh, talk about Norway. Uh, Norway, you said it uh, yesterday, uh, is already a uh, power, but almost 100% renewable energy. Why are you invested in uh, so-called floating offshore technologies? Thank you, and thank you so much for having me once again. Um, for us, uh, the development of offshore wind is mainly a possibility and to develop new industry. Uh, floating wind in particular fits very well with our competence and know-how from the oil and gas sector. So it makes perfect sense for us, uh, as we also know that we have to transition from oil and gas. This has to happen globally. Uh, if we are to reach our climate goals, we have to stop using uh, the amount of fossil fuels we are using today. And of course, oil and gas is not a renewable resource. So one day it will <laughs> have its natural end and we need to transition our industry. And for us, That's why we are um, now keen to, to push on uh, offshore wind. And of course, also because we know that globally, uh, there is a need for this to grow substantially in the years to come if, if the world is also to have access to, to clean energy for everyone. So that's why we're looking at uh, offshore wind. And, and even though we don't need maybe this power right now at the time in Norway, with everything that's happen, happening with new possibilities for industry onshore, etc., We might also need this power ourselves in the future, yeah. even though we don't need it right now. Uh, <laughs> and what made you believe in this energy specifically? Well, I believe in it because uh, renewable energy is, of course, one of the uh, key factors that we need to, to solve the climate issue. And we need to produce a lot of it. And we know there is also a pressure on on spatial planning on shore. Uh, it's not always easy to find space uh, when you have to have space for everything else that you want to do <laughs> onshore. So looking at the possibilities in the ocean, I think is just natural to do. And we know we have a lot of deep ocean areas around globally, and that's why I also believe in the potential for floating uh, to be even bigger than what we see for bottom fixed wind, because we're going to have to use space that we, we um, haven't used before, basically. Um, And for, for Norway, uh, the access to electricity is the easiest way to also decarbonize a lot of the sectors that we need to decarbonize, whether it be transportation or industry, et cetera. So we're going to need other things as well, as well but electricity, renewable electricity, is of course very important. And now you are in France and you are very happy to, <laughs> to be, we are very happy to have uh, you with us. And about this subject, of floating offshore wind power. Uh, how do you see the potential of uh, France and Norway co cooperation between uh, the two countries? <laughs> well, I think we have great possibilities for that. It's been a pleasure to be here uh, yesterday and today. I have spoken with a lot of very interesting companies. I know there are Norwegian companies also present here uh, today at this conference. Uh, there are French companies that are looking to Norway. Uh, we know that we have uh, our company Equinor has been pre-qualified for for a process going on here in France, and we have now opened two areas in Norway. We will have an auction 
uh, coming up shortly. So I think there's great possibility, and not least this region. It looks a lot like many of the regions that we have in Norway, where you have a strong maritime sector, you're strong on energy, you have industry, you have capacity to to build large constructions uh, that we need to to make this uh, this industrial adventure actually shoot uh, shoot up in speed. So. I think we have uh, a lot of possibilities to talk together. There should definitely also be discussions on, on authority level uh, and as well in industry. And it's good to make connections and this conference is a great place to make that happen. Uh, thank you. Uh, you will have in a few minutes a lot of example of our country. If you want, you can also react to uh, the presentation. On va continuer, on va se tourner vers les états unis Alors, vu le décalage horaire, on n'a pas eu de connexion en direct avec notre intervenant suivant, mais il a tenu à faire une vidéo. C'est Walter D. Mugiel, qui est Principal Engineer and Offshore Wind Lead uh, at US Department of Energy National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, qui nous en dit un peu plus cette fois-ci sur les perspectives du côté des états unis On le découvre en image. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon. This is Walt Musial. I'm with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I'm the offshore wind uh, lead for off, um, at, at the laboratory. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the opportunities in the United States for uh, floating wind power. Um, this opportunity is uh, really part of a, a larger opportunity for offshore wind. Uh, we don't actually separate offshore wind and floating in the United States yet, but um, but they'll be um, participating uh, in both industries. In, um, in March 2021, the Biden administration announced a series of coordinated steps to increase support for offshore wind in general, which includes, and most importantly, a deployment target of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by, by 2030. And this, um, this has set the pace for America to Uh, begin investing in the infrastructure to strengthen the domestic supply chain and to and for the federal government to increase some support for critical research that's necessary to achieve the goal. And also in achieving that goal, we expect that that will trigger an industry of uh, somewhere in the order of $12 billion per year in capital invest investment. If you look at the map on the on the right, The resource areas are laid out and there's several different regions and I'm going to talk about the opportunities in each of those regions. Uh, if we reach the 30 gigawatt uh, target, which we, we expect to, it's achievable, um, th then we expect that that could lead to a, a future target of 110 gigawatts um, of offshore wind by 2050. And in all cases, floating offshore wind would likely contribute and would be needed to contribute to those in order to reach those targets. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the just what's happening right now in the industry. This is a snapshot of current uh, the current status of the industry. We have really two ways of looking at the uh, pipeline. One is how many states have, have uh, committed to state policies, and then the other is the regulatory pipeline. Um, in the state policy commitments, we see about 40 gigawatts of state policy commitments from eight different states, mostly all of them on the East Coast right now. Um, and the regulatory pipeline, which is regulated by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, um, there's about 35 gigawatts of, of leased um, sites or sites that will be leased. Um, that breaks down into um, 42 megawatts of installed capacity so far in two different projects, about 800 megawatts of, of wind that's being, um, that's about to start construction. Uh, they just reached financial close at, at renewed wind. Uh, we have about 11 megawatts, 11 gigawatts, sorry, in advanced permitting, 14 construction and operating plants. Those are projects that, that are moving through the pipeline and achieving their power purchase agreements. And then there's about Uh, 12 gigawatts of unspecified uh, lease area, um, areas that are in development, but we haven't specified the project size, and about 12 gigawatts of, of wind energy areas that are, have yet to be leased. So this is all moving through at, at this time. I'm going to talk about the um, Now, the difference between the floating industry and the fixed industry, the fixed industry is, is much more developed and is starting in the areas that are in the lighter regions and it's shown in this map. But the blue, the darker blue uh, colors represent where floating wind turbines might uh, be better suited. 
And if you look at that region by region, Pacific region, we have deeper waters, which require floating technology, both in California, Oregon, and Hawaii. In the North Atlantic, we have uh, areas where uh, the shallow water uh, sites have been um, in some places depleted and will have to go to deeper waters. And in the Gulf of Maine, north of um, uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, you'll see uh, the very deep waters at where we'll need to put uh, deep uh, floating wind turbines. And in the Great Lakes, we have a, a lot of uh, deep water. You, you don't see the, perp, the the dark blue color because we didn't color it in, but there's uh, about two thirds of the Great Lakes are in, in deeper waters. And if in the Gulf of Mexico, we have some uh, opportunities, but lots of shallow water, and I won't talk about that anymore. So in um, the West Coast, we have California evolving. There's three call areas. These are the, the precursors to the wind energy areas. Uh, two of them are active and being developed, Humboldt and Morro Bay. And together they total about 600 square miles, which could support about 4.6 4 to 5 gigawatts of, of new development. In Oregon, there are no call areas yet. That's just north of there, but there's state legislation to start looking at about three gigawatts. It's a smaller state. In Hawaii, we have um, a very uh, large interest in offshore wind around the island of Oahu, where 80% of the electricity in that state is generated. And there's two call areas right now, and those are have been on hold for a while, but are starting to be active again. And we're seeing um, uh, so interest in that, that um, coming forward. And now finally in the Atlantic, we have um, um, both shallow and fixed water. And these this is a breakdown by state in this uh, bar chart. The dark, darker color in this represents the deeper water. And you can see by state that most of the um, the resource area is in deeper waters, 68% in fact. Um, in areas like the Gulf of Maine, it will be 100%, as I said. Uh, UMaine has the very first uh, floating wind project uh, called New England Aquaventus One, and that will, is likely to be the first full-scale floating turbine in the United States. In the Great Lakes, we have um, a shallow and deep water, but because of um, this highly, uh, highly populated area, we might see um, sites developing further out in the lake, which would means uh, in the deeper water as, as we go forward. It's about 10% of the resource area in the United States is in that, in that realm. So if I wrap up here, I can summarize by saying that the, we have new federal support from the Biden administration to, that just set a target for 30 gigawatts by 2030 and a possibility of, an, of a target further out for 110 gigawatts of deployment for um, for um, offshore wind by 2050. Um, we have activity and it's unique in each region, but in the Pacific, we have deep water. In the Atlantic, we have site scarcity. In the Great Lakes, we have uh, need to move further from shore. And in all cases, floating wind will likely be necessary for the US and the world to reach their carbon reduction targets. And thank you very much. Merci donc à Walter D. Mujal pour cette présentation du côté des états unis Maintenant, on va faire un tour d'horizon de l'Asie. Dans un instant, je me tournerai vers Masahiro Kuniya. Mais tout d'abord, on va aller voir ce qui se passe en Corée du Sud. Normalement, on est en visio avec Song Joon Kim. You are with us? Hello. Hello. Hello, Director of Wind Division of uh, Korea Energy Agency. Uh, you will talk about the uh, current state of uh, offshore uh, wind in uh, South Korea, of uh, support policy and long-term uh, development. Uh, I prefer to prevent you. You have seven minutes to talk to, to you, to us, uh, because it's a very uh, quick second season. Thank you very much. You can go. Uh, okay, uh, seven minutes is a short time, so uh, yeah, I will so quickly. Uh, my name is Kim Sang Jun uh, of Korea Energy Agency Wind Power Sport Division. Uh, today's presentation will be a brief introduction to Korea Energy Agency and then present about the state of uh, Korea wind power, main policies and large-scale major project. Um, how can I control the PPT screen? Uh, can I control or 
Yeah, okay. And next. I think, that, yes, you can see it's, uh, yes. And next, please. Next slide, please. Okay. The Korean Energy Agency consists of a headquarter and UN Renewable Energy Center, Greenhouse Gas Certification Office, Vehicle Testing Laboratory, and 12 regional offices. There are 740 employees in total. The main roles are to improve energy efficiency in industries, uh, buildings, and home appliances, and accelerating new and renewable energy deployment. Next slide. Uh, as you know, uh, globally, 93 gigawatt has been installed for wind power last year. Among them, China accounted for 56%. As of 2020, uh, GE of the US topped the list with a 14% market share, followed by old wind of China with a 13.5%. And Vestas of Denmark with 12.8%. On the other hand, Korea has limitations in finding the suitable site for wind power due to resident acceptance issues and environmental regulations. Uh, the newly installed capacity of the past three years is only 1068 megawatt to 191 megawatt. A total of 106 wind farms have a capacity of 1.6 gigawatt. Wind power generation account for only 0.6% of total power generation in Korea. Next slide, please. Uh, what you can see in the picture is the official wind farm currently operated in Korea. First one is the Saname Wind Complex began operation last year and has 20 turbines. Next is uh, 30 megawatt of Tamna in Jeju Island and 34 megawatt of Yongwan official wind farms. Next, please. This is uh, about status of a major Korean companies relate, related to wind turbine. In addition, there are companies specialized in various fields such as towers, offshore and floating structure, submarine cables, and installation ships. Next slide. <clears throat> From now on, I will explain the main policies, starting with the 3020 Renewable Energy Plan announced in 2017. Various policies have been announced so far. In particular, I think that the revitalization of onshore and offshore wind power uh, in 2019 and 2020 have a great influence on the wind power in Korea. Next. In Korea, the RPS system has been implemented since 2012. The annual mandatory ratio was set. Obligators must generate electricity with a new and renewable energy to satisfy this ratio. This year is 9%. From next year, over 10%. There is a concept of a waiting effect to satisfy this mandatory ratio. Onshore wind power of 1.2, and offshore wind power is divided into offshore and near offshore wind power. The final waiting effect is determined by reflecting the grid distance and depth of the water. Next, please. This slide shows KS certification system 
for large-scale wind turbine. KS certification process, uh, first one is application, and then design and manufacturing evaluation, and performance test, and overall evaluation. The last step is insurance subscription procedure. It can be recognized as an RPS facility. That is, uh, no KS certification is no RPS facility. Next, please. In this slide, I will present the integrated complex system. Wind power farm read by local government are given an additional 0.1 RPS weighting factor. The procedure is uh, as follows. Local government select site and apply to the central government and evaluate by KEA and then approve them by the central government and select project developers by local government and the developers build wind farms. Next, please. Finally, let me explain the major offshore wind power plants are currently being planned. Tsunami offshore wind power 2.4 gigawatt is expected to be gradually promoted from next year after signing an MOU on project promotion at the public private council last year. Next in Xinan, la, no, no, no. Thank in you. Xinan, large scale project of 8.2 gigawatt is planned for offshore wind power. The floating offshore wind power in Ulsan region has signed an MOU between Ulsan city and private businesses, including overseas investors. In addition, the 600 megawatt project in Jeju Island and Incheon is expected to begin step by step in 2021 and 2023. Uh, that's all. I appreciate for listening to Korean wind power status and major policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. You uh, were very efficient. I've got one question, one question for you. How Korea fits into the international vision? Vision? Uh, I think the Korean wind market is also viewed positively overseas. Um, for example, the, uh, as you know, the Orsted, the world-class wind power developer, is also active in developing the complex by establishing a Korean, uh, Korean branch. Uh, I, I, I think that since Korea uh, operate the RPS system, it is necessary to transfer more than a certain amount of uh, renewable energy. Um, I think it is important that uh, for the foreign investor, that is uh, how to secure resident acceptance will be the key point to promote a wind project in Korea. So I think it is necessary for the approach this part with this in mind. That's all. Thank you for this answer. Uh, now, et maintenant, on va partir uh, du côté de, de Taiwan uh, with uh, Chang Tian Chen. We have, you are with us? Yeah, uh, good morning. I'm good morning. from the Taiwan. Yes, Director of Energy Technology Division, uh, Bureau of Energy of Taiwan, and I let you speak about the strategy of Taiwan. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm the Tong Xian Sen from the Taiwan. I'm the Director of the uh, Bureau of Energy, Ms. Coming of Fail. I want to share some uh, experience of uh, Taiwan, especially for the uh, offshore wind policies. Uh, next one is talk about the uh, outlook of, of the 14 technologies. Uh, first, I want to talk about the energy situation of the Taiwan. I think that almost 98% of energy is imported from the other countries. 
and uh, almost uh, about the uh, eighty percent of the energy is from the fossil fuel. So at this moment, we only have the six percent of the energy of the power is from the uh, renewable energies. So the government is not a uh, uh, carbon reduction, and even for the energy security is important for the Taiwan. So the government announced for the we so called uh, energy uh, transition policies in year of the twenty twenty five. Uh, by uh, in year of 2025, the, uh, the power from the renewable energy is about 20 uh, percent. So as we think that, uh, okay, based on the 20 percent of the renewable energies, okay, the, especially for the offshore energies, uh, from the slide you can see now that for the government we separate into the, to, uh, the for the to promote the uh, offshore uh, offshore wind energies, the government separate into the three phase. A uh, first phase we so called we, we so called a deep a uh, demonstration incentive program. Uh, I think that we announced for this uh, program in year of the twenty twelve. We think that uh, okay, based in Taiwan we don't have such experience, so the demo is important for the Taiwan. The demo the, the mission of the demo means not okay the uh, regulation uh, validation. The second is about the uh, uh, technology validation. The final uh, final is about the uh, financial uh, uh, validation. You know not as uh, you know not in Taiwan, okay. The typhoon uh, earthquake. Uh, some people think that uh, maybe the offshore wind energy is not good for the Taiwan. So the government uh, to announce for the uh, deep the demonstration incentive program in the year of 2025, we choose the two uh, wind farm. One is for the we so called the Formosa one at the north of Taiwan. I think uh, for this wind farm, the commercial wind farm is commissioned uh, in year of the 2020, uh, year of the uh, 2019. And then the second one, uh, I think the state-owned power company, which is called Tai Power One, is uh, built a commercial wind farm in the central of Taiwan. I think they have great connection uh, in the, in this year, just in the August. The total is about a one uh, uh, two hundred thirty. Uh, seven uh, mega in the first one. So I think uh, based on the we so called the demo, based on the validation, we think the Taiwan we have the good potential for the offshore energy. So uh, we move to the second uh, phase. The second phase means that the owners of the potentials. Uh, the, the government announced some uh, site. The site is good for the uh, offshore energies, and we set the target of, is about the. Uh, Want to build uh, the uh, uh, offshore energy uh, in year of 2025 will be the 5.5 giga. So based on this uh, uh, policies, uh, the government announced for the detail of, about uh, how to apply for the uh, the second phase in year of 2015. So uh, by uh, by the year of 2018, we uh, we have complete all the auction. By that selection is about uh, 3.8 giga. I think that the tariff is with the high tariff. I think that the uh, average is about 18 US cent per kilowatt hours for the by the selection. So some uh, foreign com uh, company that invest for the Taiwan, like the US, like the CIP, like the P uh, WPD, even from the some company from the uh, Canada from the, uh, uh, Australia. So I think it's good for the, the our space. The second one is by the uh, auction. Auction is the total capacity is about 1.7 giga. I think the, the price is low compared to the selection. The price is about eight US cent per kilowatt out. So uh, for the, by the selection, they will, they will become a uh, commission before the year of 2025, uh, based on the uh, solution, they also have uh, have what so called uh, industrial relevance uh, uh, plan. They must have the cooperation uh, a plan with our local supply chain. By the solution, I think the price is the uh, the key issues. So the total is about 5.5 giga for the second phase. The second phase means now that the uh, the bidding uh, the bidding uh, auction price. The project will be commissioned in year of the 2025. For the selection of project will be commissioned before the year of 2024. Uh, 
So Ex that sounds good. Uh, some uh, experience. We've Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Chang. I don't know if you can hear me, but you will have only three minutes to finish your yeah, presentation you. yeah. because there is okay. a lot of presentation. Thank you for your yeah, understanding. Thank you. I know the, 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 the time issue. The second phase is about loaner development. I think that we just announced for the new uh, project from the year of 2026 to the year of 2035, we announced one point giga per year. I think the total will be the uh, 15 uh, giga for the time. So I think, uh, by the way, I think we will separate into the two uh, stage. Or first, it will be the capability review. I think uh, they have some capability. So go to the next uh, uh, next uh, process, we so-called a bidding process. So we will separate into the uh, uh, the two uh, two uh, stage. So everyone, every uh, every uh, developer can uh, join to invest of Taiwan especially for the uh, offshore energy. So by the way, the industrial relevance uh, plans also included in the, the project. Next, please. I think, uh, next slide. Okay, so I think that uh, uh, for this slide, I just uh, mentioned that why Taiwan can have so good, uh, so many offshore energy. I think for the, just for the uh, north of Taiwan, I think our potential is over the uh, 12 giga. Uh, for the last, uh, uh, for the north of Taiwan, even the west of Taiwan, but we still have uh, some east of Taiwan. We have good potential, especially for the deeper uh, waters. So based on uh, the the, uh, the experience, I think that uh, for this right, we can show that. Okay, at this moment, for the fish type, according to some report, I think the water depths is uh, about uh, seven meter depths. I think they can use the fist button uh, uh, offshore wind. But for the uh, so-called uh, uh, floating uh, technology, I think in Taiwan, we have more than 25% uh, of the site can use for the new site. Uh, I think just talking in the west of Taiwan, but in the east of Taiwan, we have more uh, deeper waters. So based on the outlook for the floating technology, I think that we will come of some uh, energies from some new technology uh, the, the, uh, developed to uh, use, use the 14 technology in the phase three uh, project. The second is that a BOE, a Bureau of Energy just evaluate for the feasibility for the demo. Based on, I think that we have a good experience for the first type of uh, validation uh, demonstration uh, project. So we can pass on this good experience we can put it into the we so-called uh, uh, protein technologies. Uh, we maybe we have some uh, incentive, especially uh, for the protein. I uh, think we just consider about the scale, how much of a scale can put into the demo, the site, and some detailed information. Okay, that's all my presentation. Uh, that's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shang Xian Shen. Uh, I will maybe have, have a question to ask you, but I'm looking at the time and it's a little bit difficult. Maintenant, nous allons parler du Japon. We will talk about Japan with uh, Masahiro Kuniya. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Director Representative Office in Europe of NATO. Maybe a uh, word to present NATO to start. <laughs> uh, merci. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, je m'appelle Kuniya. Ah, je m'appelle Masahiro Kunia de Nedo. Euh, J'habite à Paris et depuis deux ans. <rire> et donc, vous parlez français euh, Non, non, non. Non, vous parlez anglais Oui, ok. Euh, mon français est mal, donc je vais expliquer euh, mon euh, euh, présentation en anglais. Sorry. <rire> Next, please. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, I'll make this quick. quick. Yes. Uh, next slide. The other one, ah, yes. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me introduce NEDO. Uh, we are Japan's innovation R&D fund, uh, funding agency uh, for new energy. Uh, our budget is about 1 billion euro in 2021, and we allocated one third of it into the renewable energy field. Next, please. 
this uh, comparison is uh, this is a comparison of uh, renewable energy introduction status. Uh, wind power is main uh, renewable resources for European countries, and in the future, more and more renewable energy will be installed in Europe. On the contrary, in Japan, uh, solar power is the main renewable, and uh, uh, wind power uh, contributes to just 0.7% uh, of total uh, electricity at this moment because of many restrictions. Next, next please. Uh, for example, uh, typhoon, uh, lesser continental shelf, and the absence of law for utilization of sea area. Uh, but recently, to develop the uh, new energy, uh, renewable energy in sea area, uh, and act on uh, promoting the utilization of sea area for the development of maritime renewable energy power generation facility has taken effect in the, uh, 2019 at last. Next, please. Then Japan is an island country uh, with a large maritime area. However, because of lesser continental shelf, uh, the floating wind, uh, floating wind power is very suitable for the Japan, and uh, it has lots of potential. As mentioned, uh, we have a proper law to develop the renewable energy in the uh, sea area now. Therefore, if we could address the like, uh, issue of typhoon by using uh, uh, innovative technology, uh, floating wind would be the most uh, promising technology uh, for the realizing the ca uh, carbon neutral society. Next, please. Uh, to promote uh, floating technology, and the strategy on offshore wind has announced last de December in Japan. Uh, we have three pillars as shown on the screen, but I will introduce red topics today. Uh, the most important thing is to uh, create domestic um, create domestic uh, market of the offshore wind. Therefore, uh, government has announced the target 10 gigawatt in 2030, uh, 30 or 40 gigawatt in 2040. Uh, in this, uh, uh, the number of the uh, installation uh, target is smaller than that of European country, but setting a target is in this field by the government is a, uh, itself uh, is an innovative action for Japan. In parallel, we announced the Bay Area uh, Infrastructure Plan for offshore construction as well. I think uh, this announce makes the uh, innovator uh, relief. As a matter of course, uh, next generation technology is to be developed. Uh, in this context, I will show you uh, one of the floating technology which has been developed in by uh, NEDO today. Uh, next, please. Uh, uh, for a long time, uh, NEDO has uh, supporting to develop a various uh, window te technology. Uh, but for, as for the floating technology, uh, we have just one project called Hibiki uh, in the south, pa south part of Japan. This project has been started eight years ago, and this year is the uh, last year for demonstration operation. Hibiki has uh, two blades for uh, three megawatt uh, and uh, three megawatt wind turbine, and steel barge floater are used with the nine steel chain and anchor mooring. Next, please. Uh, this is a snapshot of the Hibiki project. Uh, steel barge itself was made uh, in the center of uh, Japan called Osaka area and towed to the project site in southern part of Japan called Kitakyushu area. Next, please. After assembling process completed, Hibiki was towed to the project site 15 kilometers from the coast in the depth of 15 meters. After anchor mooring connection, uh, the, the in installation was completed in 2090. Since then, we have been developing the, through collecting many data, uh, testing maintenance by using drone technology and so on. The last please. Next please. Uh, the last October, uh, Prime Minister Suga announced that Japan become a carbon neutral society by 2050. To achieve this target, a huge fund, uh, 60 billion euro, was entrusted to NEDO for green innovation te technology last year. Floating is one of the key technology. So by using this part of the uh, fund, uh, NEDO promote to develop floating technology further. And uh, we'd like to create attractive demo uh, domestic market of offshore wind for net zero emission. So if you are interested in further information, could you please uh, contact us uh, anytime?
Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup pour cette présentation. Uh, you live uh, in France. Uh, you think that uh, can be a good collaboration between Japan and France? Oui, oui. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we can see you and <laughs> give. A, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you want to to have a reaction uh, uh, all this uh, presentation, all this country? Well, uh, uh, just if I could say, I mean, very interesting presentations, and it really does show that this this industry has momentum now globally, and there are plans in, in lots of different countries moving ahead. And I also noticed that uh, several of the presentations also uh, point to the fact that it's not always easy to have local acceptance uh, to lift um, wind power. Uh, so, so the potential for, for deep sea uh, wind power is, of course, big, I believe, because conflict will be lesser there. Uh, but uh, not non-existent. Non -exi you still have to find ways to coexist with other users of the oceans um, and to make sure, I think, that all governments trying to now lift this industry also have a uh, clear policy and, and think through how they are going to do the process in a way that includes local residents, that everyone can have a say as far as possible and that you have good debates and good discussions and a framework that also makes sure that we can develop this industry in a sustainable way because... Of course, if we don't succeed in doing this in a sustainable way, it's not going to solve the bigger issue. So, but it's very exciting. And um, <laughs> thank you for having me in France. And I hope I can come visit you again soon. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame la Ministre. Thank you, uh, Tina Brou. Et, et vous aussi, uh, Monsieur Cunilla, pour cette intervention. On peut vous applaudir. Merci.